This program, Words Like Freedom, will feature Kiese Lehman, author of Long Division, and Desmond Mead, author of Let My People Vote, moderated by Reginald Dwayne Betts, June 19th, 2 p.m. Available for purchase online from the Schomburg Shop at schombergshop.com are today's featured books, Long Division and Let My People Vote. Okay, so thank you guys for joining us for this event. I'm I'm really honored to be here. And I'll um, briefly introduce our our two uh, authors, and then I'll kick it to Kiese, and um, and he's gonna start to read. And I should say that I never pronounced his name correctly. I think one thing about knowing that you love black folks is that you are willing to not pronounce their name correctly and just be like, you'll get it. You know what I mean? <laughs> and um, it's a constant point of contention. But you know, because names figure so prominently in long division. I felt like I should try my hand at pronouncing it correctly. And I felt like I should just say a couple of things about him as a writer. Um, his books, Heavy, How to Slow to Kill Yourself in America, and Long Division speak for themselves. But I think his work as a, as a cultural figure deserve highlighting. Uh, one of the things that I find really important about his craft is that he finds a way to say really important things in sentences. And he finds a way to turn his obsessions into art. One of the things that we all have is obsessions. One of the things that we all can't do is turn our obsessions into art. Mm. And um, I know Kiese would say a bit about about Desmond, but but I want to say this about um, my brother Desmond Mead. There's a lot of folks who've been in prison and there's a lot of folks who've struggled, but it's a special kind of person who turns their obsession being the struggle, being the things that they've experienced into a different kind of art which is to say a political art, an art that says that justice and freedom also comes with the last period of a bill that's written. Desmond Mead has been on the forefront of restoring the rights of formerly incarcerated folks in um, Florida, but more importantly, I think he has been on the forefront of making us understand and be aware of what we might accomplish. Uh, one more thing I'll say about them both is that you have to have vision that you could become this thing that you can't like see in the world uh, Desmond went to law school in a state, knowing that he was committed to the state and understanding that they might not let him practice law. Mm. And yet still he persevered and did his thing. And faced with that injustice, he started a powerful organization that was meant to restore the rights to those who were formerly incarcerated. And he um, makes bipartisan a thing. It's not just a term. Because Black folks have always been bipartisan, if you ask me. And Kiese, I'll just say as an artist and as a writer, you always want to bridge the gaps between generations. And in his work, you'll find somebody that's working really, really hard to bridge that gap. You know, to talk about Gorilla My Love and to talk about the current crop of writers. To always big up folks that got new books um, while bigging up himself. So I am excited about this conversation. I'm going to pass it to Kiese because he's going to read a bit from Long Division. Ain't no math in his train. <laughs> he's going <laughs> he to read from Long Division, which, um, which I find is a stunning and a beautiful book and, uh, and it has a lovely cover. And I um, mean, then he'll pass it off to Desmond and then we'll have a conversation. All right. Thank you so much, Betts. Uh, I love you. I just want to say uh, thank you to Sean Berg. And also, you know, I, I think I've been obsessed with this idea of heroes over pandemic because we keep talking about heroes, but I think I'm, I need to kind of recalibrate that and, and talk and think about models. I don't think heroes often are models, but I'm on, Zoom today with Desmond and Reginald Betts, like two of the models for how to get better at love and how to commit to change in this world. So thank y'all. Um, I'm gonna start off y'all just by reading one scene from this book called Long Division. Um, this is sort of the scene that really sets this novel off. In this scene, we have City Colson, who's one of the narrators um, at a can you use that word in a sentence contest. Um, he's going to have an onstage meltdown where he says a lot of anti-Mexican, anti-immigrant um, stuff. And his uh, onstage meltdown is eventually what gets him sent to live with his grandmother. Um, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna read the scene. And the scene starts as Lavander Peeler, his nemesis, has just completed his word and City's about to step to the mic. Lavander Peeler walked right back to his seat. Fist still clenched, no etymology, no pronunciation. The crowd and the contestants started clapping in spurts, not understanding what had just happened. 
I was clapping skin off my hands when they called my name. I stepped to the microphone, pumping my fist and looking at Lavander Peeler, who still had his head tucked in his chest. Citoyen, we'd like to welcome you too. Thanks, I told him. My name is City. Your first word, Citoyen, is niggardly. Before uttering a syllable, I ran back to our dressing room and got my brush. I, I just think better with, with this in my hand, I told a voice when I got back. No problem. Niggardly, Citoyen. For real? It's no problem? I looked out into the white lights, hoping somebody would demand that they give me another word, not because I didn't know how to use it, but because it just didn't seem right that any kid like me should have to use a word like that in front of folks who were all, or almost all, white. Etymology, please, I asked him. From Old Norse, nigla. Nigla? <laughs> That's funny. Am I pronouncing the word right? Nigga, the Lee? Pronunciation, please. Nigardly, he said. Citoyen, you have 30 more seconds. I kept squinting, trying to see out beyond the lights, beyond the stage. Okay, y'all got time limits at nationals? Hmm. I know the word, but it's just like my insides hurt when you say that word. I whispered into the mic. Is that your sentence, Citoyen? The voice asked. I sucked my teeth and spread up my brushing. You know that ain't my sentence. Citoyen, you have 10 seconds. I slowed my brushing down and angled myself toward Lavanda Pila. Um, okay. I hate Lavanda Veeler, I said. Is this your sentence, Citoyen? No. Okay. Um, I truly hate Lavanda Veeler. Sometimes more than some of y'all hate President Obama. And I wonder if LaBander Veeler should behave like the exceptional African-American boy he was groomed to be in public by his UPS working father or the um, weird, brilliant, niggardly joker he really been when he were only trying to be the only ones watching each other. I brought the brush to my waist. The judges looked at me for about 10 seconds without moving before they turned to each other. The head judge covered the microphone and started whispering to the other judges. No, Citoyen, he finally said. We are so, so sorry. That is not correct, appropriate, or dynamic usage of the word niggardly in a sentence. An example of a correct dynamic usage would be pers perspiration covered the children who stared incessantly at the woman in the head wrap since she insisted on being so niggardly with the succulent plums and melons. Please have a seat, Citoyen. I started brushing the skin on my forearms, and then I pointed my brush toward the light. That's all I could see. I walked toward my seat, then turned around and headed back to the microphone. I mean, even if I used that word right, I still would have lost. Plums and melons. You see that, don't you? The buzzer went off again. I threw my brush toward the light and the buzzer kept going off. That's messed up, I told him. What I'm supposed to do? I saw Cindy off stage to the right, motioning for me to sit my ass down. Forget you, Cindy. Look at LaVanda Peel over there crying. I hate that nigga. No, for real, I hate that nigga. I be sitting at home sometimes praying that somebody will sew his butthole so tight so he can almost die from being backed up. I'm serious. But look at him over there with tears in his eyes looking crazy as hell on TV. This don't make no sense. And look at the Mexicans over there. The buzzer kept going off. I turned around and looked at the Mexican girl in my row. You think it's hard for y'all in Arizona? Look at us. No, look at us. They do us like this in our own state. Mississippi, that's my state. Ain't nothing like these white folks can do to make y'all feel like me and Lavanda feel right now. They scared of y'all taking their jobs or cutting them in their sleep. They scared of us becoming Obama or O-Dog. I mean, do y'all even call yourself Mexican? Ain't this a competition for Americans? Yo, people, they made some slots for Mexicans, but y'all don't see no slots for no Africans and no Indians. And when I say Indians, I do mean Native Americans. Where the Native Indian and African players at? Shit. Stephanie stood up and stretched her back and walked right up to my face and she kicked me in my kneecap. And then she told me, please sit your fat ass down. I'm trying to help you out. Seriously, you have no clue how you playing yourself right now. The buzzer went off again. I put one hand on top of my belly blubber and started going over the top of my head with the palm of my other hand, short, fluid strokes. I ain't playing myself, shoot. What was I supposed to do? I said to everyone one more time, 
I bet you know my name next time. And I bet you won't do this to another little nigga from Jackson, Mississippi. Shout out to all my Jackson confidants while y'all at it. Tony, Janae, Octavia, Jimmy, and all my country niggas. Shay, Kincaid, even my my down in Milahatchee. Just trying to stay above ward. I got y'all. Deaf to all opposition. President Obama, you see how they do us down here? Why you up there calling us thugs? You see that? With that, I walked off right past my chair, past the Mexican girl, Stephanie, who kicked me directly into the backstage area. Then I turned around and walked right back to the middle of that stage. And fuck white folks, I yelled at the light. And for the first time all night, I thought about what my grandmama and my mama were gonna say when I got home. My name is City. And if you don't know, now you know, nigga. All right, I wanna introduce the great, impeccable Desmond Mead to talk to us about let my people vote. I'm so grateful and thankful to be here with you, Desmond. Thank you. KSA, thank you so much, man. Um, I tell you, I, I was just listening to you reminding me about why I like to be in the company of great brothers, man, because you guys <laughs> just forced me to elevate, right? It made me even rethink about the portion that I really wanted to read. Uh, but I'm going to stick with it. Uh, I'm actually going to be reading a portion from uh, chapter 14 in my book uh, that really uh, attempts to combine the work I was doing with Live Free campaign around gun violence and then the work I was doing in the campaign in Florida around uh, felon disenfranchisement. The work of Live Free dealt with gun violence, reducing mass incarceration and other issues that have directly impacted African-American communities. Even though I was focused on rights restoration, I couldn't escape the reality of the way everything worked together. I got to see firsthand the connection between gun violence and felon disenfranchisement. Say that a guy gets out of prison. Originally, he was arrested for selling drugs. He goes to prison, he gets out of prison. Once he gets out of prison, he can't get a job, can't get an education, can't live where he wants to. He's ostracized by his own community. What is he going to do? He's going to go back to selling drugs. And if he's selling drugs, eventually, at some point, he's going to get a gun to protect himself against people who are either trying to rob him or from rival dope sellers. And now the thing about this guy is he's not ex-military. He doesn't have any form of gun training, but at some point, he's going to end up using that gun. He's going to shoot, and because he doesn't know how to shoot straight, everybody's going to get hit but the person who he was really shooting at. And then you have innocent people dying. He's causing trauma to so many people. And we could trace all that back to the fact that when he was released from prison, he didn't want to go back to being a drug dealer. He wanted a decent life. But because of all these avenues that were cut off, he was forced back into this environment. This is the life that he was forced to live. Live Free provided that connection to the point where I often didn't feel like I was working on two separate issues. They both have a direct connection to the community, and I could work on them simultaneously. Even though I was focused on the restoration of rights, because gun violence surrounded me, there was a part of me that had to fight for the bigger picture. There were people dying every day. Every day I would go through my social media feed or, or wake up to hear a story on the news about someone who was killed. A lot of times it was young black and brown men who were victims of a drive-by shooting here. There were so many times when I was driving throughout the state of Florida from one city to the next that I would hear something on the news, a shooting in Miami, a shooting in Orlando, and I would just start crying. I used to cry a lot when I traveled. There was just so much time to think. And every time I was hit with a new account of something bad that was happening to African-Americans, I thought, wow, I don't know if any race of people in the United States that have to deal with getting gunned down or getting into altercations with police that didn't end well or getting arrested and convicted and getting disenfranchised on a daily basis. All of the things that were happening to black folks in this country aren't happening with nearly the same prevalence to any other race. If this were to happen to a race of people in any other country, we will be accusing that country of genocide. Mm -hmm. The most frustrating part about it was that people will react with grief and anger. There might even be a rally about it, 
But then it always went back to business as usual. Another black man was shot in the streets? Wow, that's bad. But it would never quite capture the interest and commitment of policymakers to stop the violence. As part of my work with Live Free, I was able to travel to Ohio to meet Michelle Alexander, who had written a new Jim Crow, Mass Incarceration in the Age of Color Blindness. I was so excited to get to meet her and have pictures taken with her because reading her book was like reading about my life. It was full of people who had been locked behind bars and then denied the very rights we thought we had won back in the 60s. We know that there's over-policing in African-American communities. We know that African-Americans are disproportionately arrested because of that over-policing and disproportionately convicted. So then you have the greater percentage of the African-American community losing their civil rights as compared to a similarly situated white community. Before the emergence of Black Lives Matter, before the murders of Trayvon Martin, Mike Brown, and Sandra Bland, race relations in this country had never been adequately addressed. Implicit racial bias and explicit racial tensions have always been there, even, if they, even as they were covered over or conveniently overlooked by other distractions or our unwillingness as a country to address it. When Barack Obama was first elected president, we expected that to be a moment when race relations made a turn for the better. Some folks say racism died the night President Obama delivered his Yes We Can acceptance speech on the stage in Chicago. But there was no appreciable turn for the better. Racism did not die, and movements like the Black Lives Matter dragged this ugly truth to the surface for the world to see. Some days I felt I could work on both issues at the same time, and other days I was torn. Looking at the activists who had tried to beat the drum about the issues impacting African Americans, just like me, there was a strong compulsion to want to dive into that. But I knew that to do it right, I would have to give it 100% of my attention. That would eventually take away from the work I was doing with felon disenfranchisement, which was the real work that I was called to do. It hurt because my people were hurting. No campaign exists in the abstract. There are always the stresses of everything else that's happening in our community or our country every single day. Nonetheless, I felt like all the signs kept calling me back to felon disenfranchisement, reminding me not to let go of my particular role to play in the grander vision. Yeah, that's good. Um, <laughs> you know, I, you know, it's interesting, right? That that they even set this conversation up this way. You know, the three of us aren't actually supposed to talk. One, you got a poet. Poets are, you know, tend to be invisible in a public and a literary space. Um, then you got a novelist and a and a memoir writer, Kiese here, who's doing his thing. But then you got Desmond. I mean, and dude, you've been to prison. I mean, I don't even believe he's talking to you. <laughs> <laughs> and uh but what i'm struck by what i'm struck by is the things that connect us all and i guess my first my first question really is um it's clear that in your work desmond you believe deeply that we need to find ways to give people dignity and that voting is a mechanism to do that so i want you each to talk about each other's work right because i believe that keith he feels the same way that like writing and telling people stories is a way to give folks dignity. And so I guess my question for you, Desmond, is how do you think about the the act of writing fiction and, and, and the act of writing poetry? Because I know you appreciate both. How do you think about those as, as mediums to give people dignity? And I mean, in your storyteller yourself, you know, folks that read your book, when they when they get to that Robert Jones at, at the at the crossroad story, mm. they hear the storytelling in that, you know. And so I wonder though, how you think about the storytelling part. And then Kiei said, I wonder, you know, how do you think about that that very different coalition building part, or maybe the very similar coalition building part when we think about how do we create audiences as writers? But I'd love to hear the, the, each of you talk about the other's expertise for a second. See, that's what you get when you're on stage with a with a poet. 
<laughs> and a novelist, right? These deep, thought-provoking questions. Well, brother, let me tell you, uh, 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 Reggie, when you, when, you, when you asked me that question, my first thought went back to when I was in prison, right? And how I remember as I was going into prison for the first, uh, first time, one of my brothers uh, told me that, that I could be locked up in a cage, but my mind does not have to be locked up, mm. right? And it was through reading that I was actually able to escape, right, uh, uh, those four walls. And, and what it did, it, it really, uh, um, works of art like this provides a, a, a avenue to escape, right? P provides an avenue to actually dream. I was just with some some young uh, juvenile, um, um, I hate to say delinquents, man, but, you know, at-risk kids in a juvenile facility, you know, and, and really talking about challenging them, daring them to dream. And so when I look at, you know, uh, Kiefe's um, work, Right. When I look at your poetry, what I see, right, is is an opportunity or a channel for people to dare to dream beyond their current conditions. Right. Because sometimes we're so we're trapped by what we see in front of us. Right. And, and especially in these days, the the, the, the misery, uh, 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 the, the limitations, um, the, the dehumanizing narrative that we face every day, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm even was able to relate to, to the character in your book, Kiesa, when, you know, thinking about that narrative that says that, you know, hey, I am a nigga, I'm a thug, right? right? And I'm supposed to be treated a certain way, right? Point blank, and no matter what I do, it's not gonna be good right. enough to win. Right, then I'm going to always be subjected, and that's the same thing that you know when you talk about a person that's been incarcerated or touched uh, um, by the criminal justice system, we're forced to carry that word felon right. with us for the rest of our lives, right? Yeah. Right, in spite of the fact that maybe we may have never been incarcerated, maybe we was just you know uh, uh, convicted and and placed on probation, but we got to carry that word with us yeah. that now impacts every aspect of our lives. Right. And so we're stuck in that space. But your writing lets us know that we can evolve beyond that, that we do have the power to 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 actually break ourselves out of that box and redefine ourselves the way we want to, not as the world want, uh, choose to see us. Oh, man, I, I really appreciate that. And I love the question, Bess. Um, You know, when I read Let My People Vote and I and, and I listened again to the actual reading that we just heard. I, I thought about growing up as a grandchild with my grandmother. Like my grandmother, I, I was there with my grandmother the first time she voted. And I think sometimes in our cynicism, understandable cynicism, some of us are like, why are we acting like the vote is the end all be all of everything? I understand that claim sort of, but I also think we have to embody it. And what I always remember, and I think Desmond makes me see it with actually particularly like more clarity is that first of all, I think, all of us are kind of interested in like trying to do what we can to ensure healthier choices and second chances for our people. It can be imaginatively, it can be uh, on policy level, it can be structural, um, it can be familial. But I also just think that, yeah, like we got, I need to remember that the first time I, well, my grandmama, the first time she could vote growing up in Mississippi, she went there knowing that the people she was voting for were not better at their jobs than she was. I remember going in there with her, she's sucking her teeth, and but she's going there to vote. It's the first time she's getting able, she's able to vote. And I just think what, what you do, Desmond, is you make me understand that one, all of these rights that we are trying to get into, we have come with a lot of, of um, like they're all conundrums, but I just don't think we need to sort of reduce black voters to sort of like robots. Like my grandmama went into that voting booth, cynical, she left the voting books, voting booth cynical, but she knew she was doing something to hopefully ensure healthier choices, and second chances for her people as well, while understanding that the system that she was being asked to contribute to was derelict. And so I just think when I when, when you look at the subtext of what Desmond is saying, it's like we need to give Black folks writ large the opportunity to be critical, but also to have every chance possible to ensure second chances and healthier choices for their posterity. And the vote, among other things, is that. So I appreciate that, brother. Thank you. I should say, um, so so I'm in here, I'm here at DC because um it's kind of cool to see all of these overlapping relationships. And I was here because my brother got this award from the prison fellowship. 
and I saw Desmond there, and I was like, man, this is like a beautiful thing to um to see Desmond there. And they said Desmond speaking, and I said, come on, man, how you gonna let Desmond speak? And I knew, and, and this is what Desmond did. He goes up there with a piece of paper, like he got the speech written on it, right? Like an old school Baptist pastor. He doesn't look at the paper one time and then just drop jewel after jewel. And it struck me that um, it is something, and uh, they call it the prophetic voice, but it is something in, in the voice that, that comes to say what we need to hear that recognizes something that people don't get, which is that, um, and I think you captured it in your book, Keith, in one sentence. I want to ask y'all to respond to this sentence. And I think what, what you captured and what you were talking about, Desmond, is that um, you don't get to this place alone. And so what I want to ask you both to comment on, I'm going I'm I'm to throw out one sentence from your book, Kiese, and then I'm going to throw out one sentence after you both speak from Desmond's book. And I want y'all to comment on this because I think it's interesting in a way, you know, books don't operate. They, they operate on that global level. But I think what's powerful about both of your books is they operate on this local level too, where mm -hmm. if I was chopping it up with a group of kids or a group of adults, I could just be like, let's just talk about this paragraph. Let's talk, let's talk about this sentence. So let me ask you this, right? You say, this is, um, this is the grandmother talking in, uh, in Kiese's book. And I feel like anytime there's a grandmother in this book, it's a shout out to your grandmama. Yeah. Um, I almost feel like you ain't going to have a crazy grandmama in your book because then you feel like you're insulting your own grandmama. But, <laughs> but, but this is what she says. She says, you're trying to get free, but you can't do it by yourself. We got to get you to that water city. That's why your mama sent you here. And I and I think um you know I want I want to hear you. That's that line. You're trying to get free, but you can't do it by yourself. I want to I, I want you to talk to us, um because that that seems like everything that matters about Amendment Four. So I want you to talk about what it means to build coalitions, and, and what it means to do something that frankly, like it's no context for it. You know, we just accepted that people with felony convictions can't vote. Mm. And we just accepted that Florida was a harder state than most and you were out back if you was in Florida. But you didn't accept that. And so I wonder how you think about that sentence in context of your work. And then, and then Kie say that sentence for you. I, I want you to think about it in context of the work of the writer because, because you know, I'm, we all like, we all like, we want to be Jordan or, or, or Curry or like, the, the corniest among us want to be Pippin. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like, 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 like we, we, we want to be in the top 50, even if we don't deserve it. And I think, you know, <laughs> but I, I think because of that, it, 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 it subverts so much of us because we all want to be free with our right. And I think our competitiveness subverts that, which means that I feel like your approach to that question has to be different from, from Desmond's because to win, he has to collaborate. And so I, I wonder how we are both who responded that? Mm, wow. So I'm 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 going to actually, um, I think I'm going to come a slightly different way, right? So when when I yeah. hear you can't do it by yourself, the first thing that comes to my mind is humility. Mm. Humility, and, and and what I mean by that is, you know, one of the things I learned early on, um, especially even when I talk to my colleagues out in the field, you know, uh, um, a fellow. Uh, uh, returning citizens or justice impacted or formerly incarcerated people, however they identify themselves. And I tell them this all the time that I don't have a monopoly on the pain and suffering, nor do I have a monopoly on the solution. Right. And I think what, what you no, know, when I, when I, when I think about that, it's like, you got to have a certain level of humility that allows uh, 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 folks to be able to play a role in the grander scheme of things, right? And strengths your ego enough for you to understand what your lane is, right? And how you can best contribute to the overall movement, right? Because I don't have all the answers and therefore I can't demand that everything goes my way. I can't actually just be the only one that's doing this work, right? That is, it's gonna take, it's gonna take a community and it's going to take a community with different perspectives and approaches, right? And so when I look at that and I look at, at, at the movement and understanding that even there's even space for people who are not directly impacted because there was a time when I didn't want to be um, 
a, 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 a lump together with families, right? Of, uh, of people who had a loved one that was incarcerated. Mm -hmm. I thought that there was, theirs was a different type of, of suffering, right? Not really understanding that when I did time, my family did time right mm -hmm. along with me, right? And so how do you understand that? Listen, even though, you know, I've experienced uh, 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 the trauma of incarceration, uh, how do I understand that my trauma may be a little bit different than your trauma, uh, Bets? You know what I'm saying? Maybe different than the other person's trauma. And then I am out now. I've been out for quite some time. What about that brother or sister that's still incarcerated now? Are they going through different traumas that I have never been through? And so understanding that makes me un realize that no matter uh, or what people may say about me or, 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 or whatever accolades I may get, that I'm not the only voice, right. right? And I can't be the only voice uh, because if I was the only voice, my, my life would be in danger right, right. now, right? right? And so we have to create because when you have only one person on top, guess what? Oh, you want to stop a movement? Kill the leader, That's right. right? But when there's multiple heads, then that actually creates more safety for you because they know you, they're not nothing um, positive is going to happen, or they're not going to be able to accomplish whatever they're trying to accomplish just by knocking you off. Because there's just too many people out there, and so that's the way how, uh, for the purposes of this conversation, that I really want to respond to that. You know, you definitely can't do it by yourself. But at, at, at the biggest thing that jumps out to me is that that means that we have to be humble enough to understand that. Right. And be willing enough to allow other people to play the role that God has given them to play in right. the grander scheme of things. I love that. I love that. And and, and now I'll, I'll just try to say on that on that sentence, I'll make maybe two points. The first one that is if we apply um, that quote from that character to writing, writing life is, you know, I sort of pity the writer who feels that they have to do it by them, who, who doesn't be, who, who believes that they have to do it by themselves, because though our physical bodies often have to be alone, toiling through space and time and memory and imagination, like writing for me became less sort of violent when I really accepted like all of the characters in my chest and I accepted all of the audiences in my head who I wanted to connect to. And I know a lot of writers are like, I write for myself, I pity those people. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't believe I write for myself. I don't write for myself. I don't believe I write to myself. I mean, I feel like I'm sometimes have to be in that room trying to get the words out, but I'm listening to the characters in my chest and I'm and I'm thinking hard, yo, I'm trying to write to Desmond. I'm trying to write to Betts. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm trying to write to Khalil. Like, I, I want, I, and, and so we have to fine tune that, that artistic sort of tool that not just creates the words, but that finds a way to connect the word to the people we love. That to me is not a solitary thing, although physically it is solitary. So I think it's a paradox. The second part of that quote, I think is like a critique of us as adults. You know, this book starts with my long division starts with this black two black characters and Mexican characters on stage, supposedly letting down their race. And for this one black character, you know, he goes to the country, he's told by his grandma and everybody else, this is what you did wrong. They're holding him to these standards that are, he seems to be sounds to him like they're presidential. And the thing about what happened to this character, what happened to me as a young black person, possibly what happened to y'all is when I quote unquote, let the race down, nobody asked me how I felt. Nobody was like, how do you feel, Kiese? You know, even when I'm getting my ass whipped, I'm getting that speech that a lot of us got when we were getting our ass whipped by our grandmamas and our mamas and our aunties. And I understand why they were whipping that ass. Like I really needed somebody to ask me how I felt. And what that grandmother is doing, though it is done with love is saying, I know what you feel. I know you're trying to get free. And I know you need this to get there. And I think that's a different conversation if she says, I think you're trying to get free, baby. Can you tell me what you feel? I've never had that experience, but I think that's an experience we owe to all young people, especially like black young people in this country. Yeah, and I think, I think that actually, that actually makes me think about something different. And I wonder how you both feel about this. I feel like um, it's a, um, we do a good job of, um, like criticizing the past. And I feel like it's something in what you just said to ask us, how do we think about the work that we do in the present? And um, and so I wonder, how do you guys confront when you imagine that your work is off balance? 
But actually, just mm-hmm. think about that for a second. I, I want to throw this thing in here that Desmond said, though, because it's some Robert Johnson in his book. And so I'm going to come back to the point I just made. But what I found in this, in this thing in here is like, you know, it's hard to write a memoir that feels memorable and feels resonant, especially when it's tied to a legit political movement. And your memoir is tied to like like a legit, let me say what we're trying to accomplish. Mm-hmm. And let me and let me give you the metric for judging this work, right? And you've 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 exceeded beyond that metric. And yet I still think your mem that your memoir is a is a piece of art. And this piece right here just hits me. I'm going to read the whole thing just because I like it. I was staying at the curb where the train was going to come around the bend. And I could not leave. I could not cross the track. The tracks. That was the end of the road for me. I was just waiting and I waited. I have no idea how long I waited because I was so empty. I'm sure someone had identified me already out there. Maybe there were people whispering at that very moment, there's a crazy man out there. But I was oblivious to their concerns, and I wouldn't have responded to them anyway. Or maybe I was invisible to them, just like homeless people are too so many, are too so many of us. Either way, I wouldn't have cared about who saw me or what they or what they were thinking because I was ready to end my life. But for some reason, that train didn't come that day. I waited there for what felt like hours because of the zone I was in, and the train just didn't come. Mm. And you and you know. I think that obviously this is like, this is not a metaphorical train. You know, this is a legit train. And I think that obviously like you could have checked, you know, the schedule and been like the train is not coming today. But, but what's powerful about it is that we never (laughs) check the schedule for the train. Right. And we put ourselves in a situation where sometimes we get flattened by the train um, that we're afraid to get out of the way of. And so what I, what I want you both to respond to is, um, as for you, Desmond, since you wrote that and you actually lived through that moment, I, I, I wonder how do you talk to others, like not about the choosing not to move, because because that part ain't the part that matters as much as like what you did when you said, OK, I got to move now. So what, what I want to know is how do you talk to folks about how do you come to that decision when you move? And, and Kia says, as an artist, I would love to hear you just chime in on um. Like the, the thing I hate about writers, and, and I resent this so much, I'm, I'm going to tell you the truth. When dudes be talking about, you know, how many words they write a day, <laughs> and they be like, well, you know, James Baldwin wrote 19 books. I'm always like, well, Ralph Ellison wrote one. Mm. You know what I mean? They'd be like, Aristotle wrote 600 books. Right. And, I just, and I'd be like, it's only one Bible. So, you know, Jesus yeah. wrote one book. I don't even think he wrote that one. He has right. no authors. <laughs> right. So, so what, what I want you to talk about, Kie say is the is the way in which like all of us get stuck in the headlights and, and it's hard to move forward as a writer and I wonder what pushes you forward and um and yeah man Desmond I I wonder how you talk to people about what comes after because that's the you know like 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 that could be the last page of the book but it's not <laughs> you know that's like yo dude I mean you 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 duck the train but it's all of this work that comes right. afterwards and that's what I found so powerful about that being centered in the beginning of the book. Yeah, so um, I appreciate that question, man. Um, you know, for a point of reference, though, that that particular train track historically has been known that uh, trains are coming like almost every 30 minutes or so. Mm. Uh, oh, those, tracks, those tracks <laughs> led directly to the Port of Miami and the yeah. produce section uh, um, in, in Miami. So it was very busy. Railroad, uh, railroad tracks, but for some reason, I don't know what happened, man. But I, I ain't see no sights of the train. But mm. as you were, you was asking your question, I kind of jotted down what caused me to take that step, right, cross those tracks. And I'm gonna tell you, I don't know what the hell caused me to do that. But the key piece wasn't me stepping across the tracks. The key piece was what happened when I stepped across the tracks. And I turned around and looked back at those tracks. Mm. That is what set it all off, right? Because when I when I crossed the tracks and then turned around and looked back at those tracks, I had asked myself that pivotal question. What if I would have died? What if a train would have come and ran and killed me? How many people would come to my funeral? Right? And, you know, the immediate response was zero. 
Nobody would have came. Mm -hmm. I was homeless. You know, they, I didn't have any ID. I would have been buried in the pauper's grave, right? And I didn't, I didn't like that, right? It felt so empty, right? And then I thought about, okay, well, what if my picture was on the front page of the Miami Herald, Desmond killed by train, top of the fold, right? How many people now would come to your funeral? And let me tell you, I, I, I mean, I searched through my mind, I searched through my life, uh, from living in Florida to living in Illinois to uh, uh, living in Hawaii to being in the military, all the different girlfriends, all the different friendships. I went through my entire history and I could only come up with four people that would have came to the funeral. And out of those four, probably two would have shed a tear. The other two would have been talking, throwing, throwing all kinds of shade, right? <laughs> And yo, yo, did you hear how Desmond almost took it back on himself? He did, he did. Uh, <laughs> slippage, slippage. <laughs> but, you know, and just that thought about, you know, and I had to question myself that, you know, living so long on this planet and, and doing so many things and having all these different relationships, thinking that maybe only four people would care if I died, you know, and, 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 and I go back to, you know, I th God, I can't remember the name of that um, paradise lost, mm. right? That thing about this, this concept that that man has always been searching to get back to that, to his, the womb of his mother, where he felt that love and that, that comfort and protection and realizing that, man, all I really wanted was to be loved and to feel love and to feel like I did, like, I am somebody and not thinking that when I die, the world is going on and nobody's going to give a damn about who Desmond is or whatever. The, so what the hell have I been doing all this time? Mm. Yeah. And that kind, you know, that, that empty feeling caused me to just turn around and walk two blocks further, check myself in the drug treatment. I didn't know mm. what I was going to do or, 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 or what was going to come of it, but I knew that that's where I was led. Uh, and that it was that that sick, empty feeling inside, right? No, somebody gonna love me before I leave this. Earth, I know, know that's right. Somebody, no, that's that's so legit, man. I, you know, you know, I, you know. Honestly, man, I honestly like, and, I, and maybe that's what I want to ask you, Keith. Like to the same question, but I, I, I actually truly think that that committing to that is is just so challenging man and so i'm i'm deeply grateful that that you were able to come out out of that and tell the story because it ain't easy a lot of dudes want somebody to care about them but it is so hard to get from you know what i mean that you know like it's, it's so hard to get from the bobo to the real you know right. it's so hard from like saying you want somebody to love you to doing things that that really are humble and don't look to edify yourself and i and i think i've seen that sort of consistently even even in hearing you talk to Marcus folks and, and, and like the different places that I've seen you in and the different connections that we have. So I appreciate it. And I appreciate the Sean Burke because for real motherfuckers don't shit. Is today Sunday? Saturday, ain't it? <laughs> no, it's Saturday. We oh, all right, cool. All right, cool. <laughs> and I'm, I'm cussing the shit in front of the Kennedys. You know what I mean? Yeah, That's no. Just like, <laughs> but no, but for real, I, I appreciate the Sean Burke because usually they don't let black folks like this talk. Right. You know, you know, like 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 to think about this, this sort of combination and connection that we make it now, I think is I think is like a unique one and it's an important one. And it's important for folks to hear your voice alongside Kia says. And so Kia say, let me just reframe what I asked you a little bit. I mean, you got this thing about being on the train tracks and being incapable of moving. And, and what I meant to say is that the success of some writers make that feeling illegitimate, like the success of some people make what Desmond just expressed feels illegitimate. And for real, if you don't write that sentence, it seems like bullshit when somebody else says it. And that's why it's powerful, because in the face of everything you've accomplished, you admit to have been at the crossroads right. and, and maybe not coming up off that railroad track, right? Yes. And you telling us where that track is situated in the produce section and like somebody grapes is fucking up your life because they got to get their grapes on time. It's like real. And so what I want to ask you, Kie, say is like to, to just speak to what it means to be a writer. And I'm talking to you about me. You know, I got yeah. a book. We got it. We got the same editor. Right. The book was due a few days ago, right. a few weeks ago. It was due a little while ago. You know what I mean? And right. I know what it feels to be like that writer that's struggling to the finish line. And I know that you've been that writer with long division with how to slowly kill yourself. And so I wonder 
you know, how do you push to get to the breakthrough that's heavy? How do you keep yeah. going when the early work is saying, you from Mississippi, but you ain't right. Richard Wright. Right, right. You know what I mean? You, know. you, you just from the mud. And right. there's a lot right. of people from the Mississippi mud. Yeah, I, yeah. I wonder how you push, especially in the face of so many writers who love right. to say, and I love those folks. Right. But, but we love to say how much we work as if, as if the work it is like guaranteed to happen, you know, as right. if like, as if you're guaranteed to get up off of that train tracks. And I don't think you are. So I want, right. I don't think we are. So I wonder how do you think about that in the context of who you are? Yeah, as a and man, Bess, I want to thank you for, for, for reading um, that uh, paragraph too, because I'm going to try not to ramble, but you know, what Desmond just showed us is the difference between a writer and a writer who built like that. And, and if you just give me a little second, you know, one of my best friends was working on this um, memoir with somebody and they were helping him write it. And the person who, they, who, who, who to, you know, the person who wanted the memoir written by my friend was like, I want a memoir that's going to be like suicidal thoughts on Biggie's first album, Ready to Die. And so my friend was like, OK, you want to go there? And so my friend started asking him all these hard ass questions, pretty much like, talk to me about when you looked at that railroad track. And the person was like, no, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about when I'm on the other side. You got to be built like that, fam, to describe what your body, your eyes, your mind, the environment felt like when you did not want to be here anymore violently. You got to be built like that, but, but none of us are built like that from birth, right? Like, this is a thing, like, it takes tons of practice. And the thing I think writers forget and then remember is like, yes, there's a ton of practice that has to happen, like, in front of that computer solitary. But the practice that allowed... Desmond to do what he did in that scene. And to me, it's to linger in that moment. That's what makes crossing the tracks, looking back, like resonant. That's what makes going into rehab resonant. It's sitting in that shit that none of us want to sit in. None of us want to sit in. But the question to me is, as a writer, how do you make yourself built like that? How do you get yourself over the tracks? Well, you got to you, you gotta write, sit there and patiently linger at the tracks every second. And I just think sometimes in lauding how long we write, how many pages we write. What we don't talk about when we talking to each other about writing is the fuck shit I had to do this morning I did unsuccessful. But I think that's how you become a writer who built like that. And I hear it in Desmond, Lord knows I hear it in everything you do, Bet. But I just wanna say like, I, I think we sometimes fetishize writing, just, just the act of writing. And when you fetishize writing, you fetishize writers. And when you fetishize writers, you fetishize reading which we know in this country has been hella anti-black, hella misogynistic, hella like a, like a cheerleader for empire. So we can't cheerlead these things that lead us to cheerlead in our own demise. And I just think like that what you just read from Desmond and what Desmond just said makes me realize like why we can't cheerlead that person who writes 15 million books solely because they wrote 15 million books or two hours just because they wrote two hours. It's about lingering, fam. And I just feel like that's what Desmond does so brilliantly. Yo, so look, that was a dope answer, but y'all got to know, Kiese stay on brand too, because that's actually one of the themes of the book. You know, I was mad. First of all, is there such thing as a sentence contest? Nah, like, I mean, I mean, like, battle rap. Shit, I, I think rap is sentence contest. I think, so, I think, I think battle rap is a sentence contest. You know, because what, because what I felt profound about the book, right? When I was reading this, I'm like, man, I would have aced that shit. You know, me but, too. <laughs> <laughs> but but the other part about it though was that I thought that 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 um that my man was like fundamentally said he was like but but something is not right about this and the thing that wasn't right about it was like the fetishization of reading was right. like how do you value the articulation of a sentence but not care about what's in it and I think Lavar was thinking the same way except Lavar. Yeah. And he was like so trying so hard not to be a nigga though. And I gotta <laughs> tell y'all something. He tried hard. You know, I, I'm cited in this lawsuit, right? With somebody, some white kid that was that was using the N-word. And see, when I say he was doing, I say the N-word, but when I'm talking about, it, I'm gonna say nigga, right? But this white kid was using the N-word at this school in some really racist ways, right? And so the school felt like, and I'm not even saying I agree with the school, but the school felt like he needed to be expelled. So then in a lawsuit. I had said nigga on Twitter, right? I was like, yo, this nigga say to me that uh, I, I got affirmative action in the law school. I'm like, yo, check my L set. Check my resume. Nigga, you ain't better than me in nothing, right? <laughs> so, so some white dude responds 
don't ever use the N-word anywhere, ever in your life. So since I don't know him, I don't respond back, but I quote tweet him. And I say, nigga, please. In the lawsuit, they they screenshot all of this shit, right? Wow. I don't know none of these white niggas. I don't even have wow. nothing to do with their lawsuit, right? And in fact, I support this kid not being expelled and them figuring out some other way to deal with his racism. But they quote me in a lawsuit and say, you know, in the same way that we respect Mr. Betts, ability to use the n-word as he pleases we also respect our child and i'm like get the fuck out of here and what that makes me think here right and i'm sorry to make this about myself for a second but i want them to cite this in their lawsuit do this what this what this makes me ask you both right it's because you know we had these words like felon that stick with us forever and then you got motherfuckers who call a book felon you know they just try really hard <laughs> to be contrarian you know they try really hard to push up against the grain I want y'all both to talk to me about language because I think as a writer, you know, one of the sentences that homie, I don't even know if City knew what the word niggardly meant because it's such a contradiction mm -hmm. to like to like what the word nigger does, except maybe it's actually it's actually maybe it's a contradiction because nigger is so capacious. Right. And niggardly is so limiting and mm -hmm. it's so like like offensively limiting, you know, and it's hard to like think about it in that way. But what I want y'all both to talk about it's language in your work. And it's some superficial level, I think, where we could talk about felon, formerly incarcerated, returning citizen. But I think on a really deeper level, Desmond, your work forces you to grapple with, with what it means to, to work with Republicans. Mm. What it means to work with Republicans who, who, who might feel different kinds of ways about what people are owed if they commit certain crimes. And so I wonder mm. like, how you thought about language as being a vehicle for you to get to love and how language has been a barrier for you to get to love. Mm. And the Kie say, you just seem to be disrespectful as hell, man. And I say that with the utmost compliment, mm. really. And so what I want you to talk to about is like, it's like, are there limits to what kind of language you find to be permissible? Mm. All right. You want me to start? Who, 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 who jumping off? Since Desmond started first, we throw it at you at, at you first. Um, okay. Um. Yeah. So you know, the thing about me is like again, from my, I'm from Mississippi, and you know, I want that to mean everything, but I know we in Mississippi, so it don't mean much right now. But I just, I just was raised by people who like we are going to be, we got immaculate home training. We're gonna be kind. We're going to listen. We're going to ask you if you need something to drink. We're going if we have money, we're going to ask you if you need some. But if you disrespect us, you're going to have to hear from us precisely because we will never actively disrespect you. And so I'm not, I ain't disrespectful. I got a lot of home training, but you're not just going to shit on me and my people because we wouldn't do that to you. That's, that's, that's the thing. And in terms of language, Fan, part of the revision of long division of part of the revision of long division was thinking very hard about like you know some of those kids use words that are anti-immigrant anti-semitic anti-black you know definitely misogynist um and and i didn't think the book did enough work to actually like frame the words and frame the character do you know what i mean yeah. so like i'm very thoughtful about the words we write and I understand that the words we, we we might be writing now, like you are about to turn in this book that I know is about to shake the fucking world. And I know 10 years from now, maybe five years from now, you're going to look back at some of those words and think that those words were abusive in some way. You should. And I think you will because you actively think about revision. You see what I'm trying to say? So, like, I'm yeah, not yeah. one of these people who thinks the shit that I say today needs to stand two weeks from now. Like, if I'm doing my job as a as a human, as a listener, as a, as a, as a, as, a, as someone who loves, like like expression, I'm gonna be thinking about the shit that I said even here that wasn't as clear, but also might've been abusive. And I just think like that is the work of people who wanna make the world freer and ensure uh, healthy choices and second chances. We gotta be willing to look back at the word choices we use and the ways that they pummel some people, sometimes pummel ourselves, but it's hard to do that if you one of them, I can't look back ass motherfuckers, you know what I'm saying? So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's actually, that's actually real, especially for a novelist, cause that's a lot of revision, like as a poet, Right. You know, um, most poets don't worry about I, I almost, when you was there, I think when I almost cussed this kid out that was telling me that he, he was like, yo, Dwayne, do you revise poems that got published? And I was like, man, where did you go to school at again? What? I, was, I remember that. I remember that. <laughs> but, uh, 
But Desmond, tell us, man, I, I appreciate what, what Kiese said. I think that's real as a writer. But I still wonder um, how you approach this as, as really – I don't even know if you think about yourself as a politician, man. But I do – I'm waiting for you to run for governor. So um, would you tell us how you think about that? <laughs> Don't put that out there yet, man. Hey, yo, ho, 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 ho. I'm still ho, contemplating. Did you see that? But did you see that careful use of language? Did yes. you see that 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 adverb, right? That that yet? <laughs> yes. <laughs> but you know, I, listen, I, I I I don't I don't view myself as a politician, more of a public servant. And there is yeah, a distinct yeah, yeah. difference, right? Politicians Definitely. are involved. This country get divided and people die. And public service yeah. get involved, and we have an opportunity to come together and live. Uh, mm. But, you know, as it relates to language, and I learned early on, uh, very early in the campaign, about this thing called primal reactions or primal mm. responses and how uh, language is one of the mediums that can trigger that, right? Depending on what you hear, right, will evoke something that's deep inside of your subconscious that causes you to react a certain way. Um, and, and and so I, I think I caught on pretty early uh, in the campaign the power of the words that we use, right? And one of the things were that, uh, that for instance, when you, there was a difference between saying the right to vote as opposed to the ability to vote, mm -hmm. right? And how we chose to use that would actually be the difference about whether or not we were able to get a broader cross section of people to support our efforts, or it was just gonna be the same usual suspects that was supporting something that maybe felt good, but didn't end up in a win, right? The other uh, experience I had was I remember during um, election, uh, 2018 election, when we had this thing on the ballot, and I remember pulling up to, uh, <laughs> excuse me, one of the most, uh, 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 um, and I'm not, I can't call that county out, but one of the most racist county in the state of Florida. I mean, where KKK live and thrive, right? Extremely conservative county. And we go to the voting location and right across the street, this guy have prime location, right? Where he have all kinds of signs for Republicans, right? And I remember getting off our bus and I told my son, I'm going to get one of my Amendment 4 campaign signs on this doggone property, right? Because I love challenges. And as I was walking up, this white guy comes out of the house and he kicks this pastor off of his property, right? Now, I remind you, there's a fence and then there's a grass, grassy area and then there's a road. And when you cross the road, you're walking in to go vote. The pastor was in the grassy area on the outside of this guy fence. This guy came and kicked him out. And when I asked him, why did you kick him off? He's, this pastor was wearing a jersey that had the number seven on it. Now, mind you, it wasn't the San Francisco 49er jersey. <laughs> it was a regular Buffalo jersey that he got at Marshall's. It right. just had the number seven on there. Wow. But because the guy seen the number seven, that evoked anger in this man to kick a pass off his property. You with me? And yeah. so as I'm talking to this guy, he starts getting on the African-American candidate. We had Andrew Gillum talking about how he's a socialist and all of this. And, you know, he's one of those cap lovers and cap is disrespecting the country and all of that. And, and I asked him what I, I told him, I don't know what a socialist is, but what is it that you have against socialists? Mm. And he started listing off a couple of things. And, and some of the things that he said was that he is scared about a government that that can do whatever they want the people and get away with it. Right? <laughs> and I said, you know what, bro? I, and I called him, bro. I got close to him. I said, you know what, bro? All of those things that you worried about, guess what? Cap was kneeling for you, man. Word. That's what Cap was kneeling for. And when I told him that, his eyes just glazed over, right? And then turned to f come to find out his mom and his sister were returning citizens who needed their right to vote back, wow. right? And before I left, I had prime location on his property with Amendment 4 signs. And it wasn't just something that was just symbolic. We went back there uh, two days later, them signs were still there, right? All right, that's... that's, that's, I, tell that's that, I tell that story, man, because... The power of words, right? 
can cause a person to hate the very same thing that they need or desire without even realizing it, right? Well, I'm a, because I'm of a, what it triggers, the language. And so yes. to, be, to be able to use language in a way to break down these barriers, right, I think is it, it, an art, right? And, and it, it takes, I think, well, a, a, a lot of discipline because... So look, they're going to kick us off the stage. And I want to say, um, I hate to cut you off, but they told me 10 minutes ago that we were supposed to wrap up. And I was like, look, we from Mississippi and Florida <laughs> and, and, and PG County, Maryland, so we're going to go for a few more minutes. <laughs> but, but that was a perfect point to end it on, because I do think when you say that it's an art to make people see you, I think that you said all of it, you know? And I think the art that you bring into the world is allowing folks to see us, and I deeply appreciate it. And I think, Kie say you do the same thing. And I'm glad that we're able to connect these two arts, to think about what it means to fight for people's rights and to fight for the right to vote, as well as to think about the fight to have something that we can read that matters. It's truly an art, man. This was fun. We could have did this for another half an hour. I, it's a bunch of questions from some of the viewers that I wanted to ask that I didn't, I didn't get a chance to. But you know what, viewers? The answers to your questions are in their books, are in their works, are in their lives. So you can check it out there. Thank you for tuning in with us. We greatly appreciate it. Much love to Songbird, for real. Thank y'all. Yeah. Peace, y'all.